Um, welcome everybody to another in our colloquium series, joint Duke UNC colloquium series. Um, I'll just remind everybody of a couple of procedural things. Please keep yourself muted um, unless you're asking a question. And if you have, if you would like to ask a question um, in the, during the talk, um, just a short clarifying question, you can either use the raise hand feature or you can uh, put it in the chat and I will try to monitor that and uh, let Amy know what the question, you know, let Amy know that you have a question. Um, uh, at the end of the talk, of course, we'll have a chance for, for more extended discussion in a, in a Q&A session. Um, I did want to mention, I, I, I don't think he's here right now, but I did want to acknowledge in some public forum that uh, Duke's uh, own professor, Barrett Mueller, was the recipient of a major prize from the American Physical Society today. Um, for his work um, on, on uh, signatures, expected signatures of the quark gluon plasma. Um, and it's kind of fitting that uh, we, we hear today about more recent developments in QCD that, uh, that, that um, are, are connected to the work that Barrett has done over the years. So if you see Barrett around, um, congratulate him. I don't know if anybody will see anybody around these days, but um, it's, a, it's a nice thing for, for him, of course, and for the department and our whole nuclear physics community here. Um, so today's speaker will be uh, Professor Amy Nicholson from UNC, and I will turn it over to John Engel to introduce her. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to introduce Amy Nicholson, um, who has been at UNC. She's in her fourth year here. Um, her background is she did undergraduate work at NYU and then went to University of Washington in Seattle, where she did um, graduate work with David Kaplan, um, then moved to Maryland for postdoc and, and then to um, Berkeley for another postdoc, where she got heavily into numerical lattice QCD. Before that, um, she was involved with more general many body problems with nucleons as well as, as quarks and gluons. And um, today she's going to talk about her work on lattice QCD and exploring physics beyond the standard model. So, Amy, we're looking forward to it. Great. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction and thank you to everyone for being here today. Um, much of the work that I'm going to talk about uh, was done in, with my collaboration, CalLAT. Um, at one point, we were all in California, and now very few of us are, but we decided to keep the name. So uh, let's begin. So the standard model, um, we know that this is one of our most well-tested theories in physics. Um, and here is just a picture of the different particles and the different force carrying particles that we have in the standard model. However, we know that it doesn't describe everything in the universe. So we already have hints of physics beyond the standard model. For example, the standard model can't explain why we have matter in the universe at all. Um, there's essentially a symmetry between matter and antimatter built into the theory. And so we need to look for beyond the standard model physics in order to generate the matter antimatter asymmetry that we now see in our universe. Um, and other uh, things like dark matter and neutrino masses, um, these are not part of the standard model. We would just like to understand the nature of such things. And so experimentally, um, I've kind of grouped the different kinds of experiments looking for beyond the standard model physics into two different kinds. So one, um, you have accelerator physics. These are looking at very high energies. They um, accelerate particles to large energies where what would otherwise be very rare processes are enhanced at these high energies. And they look for signatures of these rare processes that don't belong within the standard model. 
But there's another sector of BSM searches which um, involve low energy physics. So one example, um, if you cool things down to very, very low temperatures, such as at ultra cold neutron facilities, then you have very precise experimental control over what you measure from these neutrons. And so you can very, very precisely measure some quantity, for example, the lifetime of the neutron. And in order to look for beyond the standard model physics, what you can do is you can calculate that same quantity within the standard model from theory and then compare the results you get. And if they're different, then clearly nature is including things that are not included within the standard model and you can use that as a signal to understand them. Another class of low energy beyond the standard model searches involves heavy nuclei um, and What's special about these nuclei is that there are many of them. Um, they all have their own interesting properties. And some of these properties are such that they enhance these rare signatures that we're looking for. Um, for example, if we want to look for violation of um, charge parity reversal, then we can look at special nuclei which have what are called octo octopole deformation. So they're spatially deformed. They have a non-zero octopole moment. And these um, nuclei, they have parity partner eigenstates. So if you do the mirror image of this nucleus, you get another state which is very close in energy. And these nearly degenerate uh, partner states tend to enhance the signals that you're looking for in CP violation. Another example is looking for neutrino double beta decay, which I'm going to use as an example um, throughout the rest of the talk for how theory can help with these low energy BSM searches. So um, in looking for neutrino double beta decay, which I'll describe in a little bit more detail later, essentially the experimentalists need to see a simultaneous double beta decay. So most nuclei, um, they will undergo a single beta decay and produce an electron and a neutrino. Some nuclei, this single beta decay is kinematically forbidden. So due to the fact that nucleons within these nuclei want to pair up, it actually becomes energetically unfavorable to undergo a single beta decay. However, it is energetically allowed to do a double beta decay to a nucleus that has um, two more protons than neutrons. And so if you use these special nuclei, then you can pinpoint the double beta decay without being swamped by all of the single beta decays that are much more likely. So um, starting with this example, let's take a look at what theory can do to try to inform these experiments and try to draw as much information as we can out of limits and signals from them. So I'm just going to give a very brief overview of neutrinos double beta decay. Um, we know that neutrinos have mass and this is already beyond the standard model physics. What we don't know is how these neutrinos generate their mass. Um, so it can be one of essentially two ways. So most particles get their masses through what's called a Dirac mass, where you combine a particle and an antiparticle and together they have an interaction that generates a mass through interaction with the Higgs boson. But you can also have what's called a Majorana mass. And if you have a Majorana particle, then that means that there's no distinction between the particle and the antiparticle. So essentially the neutrino and the antineutrino are not distinct states. And we could verify this through the following process. So this is a schematic of a diagram involving elementary particles. We have two down quarks. They can produce a W boson and turn into a U quark. The W boson then um, undergoes a transformation to an electron plus a neutrino. So this occurs at both of the beta decay um, diagrams here. And then if you have Majorana neutrinos, the same neutrino that's produced in one can become absorbed as an antineutrino in the second one because the neutrino and antineutrino are not distinct particles. So in this case, you would have two electrons coming out, but no neutrinos coming out. 
And this is what's called a lepton number violating process. So lepton number counts the number of leptons minus the number of antileptons. And because we started with no leptons, we just had two down quarks, and we ended with two electrons, we have changed the number of leptons in our system. And lepton number is a very important symmetry um, of the standard model. It is broken, but at a very small degree. Um, and essentially, if you can show that this lepton number is violated, then that gives you a mechanism for producing a lepton number asymmetry in the early universe. And this can be converted to a matter asymmetry. So this could be a source of the generation of this matter antimatter asymmetry that we are trying to understand. So this is why it's important. Not only do we learn about neutrinos, but we also might have a mechanism for this matter antimatter asymmetry. Why might you think that neutrinos are Majorana? We haven't observed elementary particles that are Majorana. Um, all the ones that we know of are Dirac, but there are some compelling reasons why we might expect them to be. So um, the first is just that anything not forbidden by symmetry should occur in nature. So if something doesn't occur, um, so through quantum mechanics, you know that you're going to explore all of the different possibilities and if you never have a process occurring that typically comes because there's some symmetry forbidding it. If there's no symmetry forbidding it, you have to come up with another reason why you're not seeing it. So if lepton number is not something that we expect to be conserved by the standard model um, or by nature, sorry, then uh, we should expect to see these lepton number violating interactions. And it also answers the question for why are neutrinos so much lighter than all of the other particles that we have? Um, it took a long time to even realize that neutrinos had mass. It's very, very small. So just a very simplified uh, model that you can use to explain this is called the CSUN mechanism. Um, and so again, anything not forbidden by symmetry should occur in nature. So let's assume that neutrinos have both a Dirac mass, like all the other particles do, and a Majorana mass. Um, hopefully you know from the standard model that you have uh, so-called left-handed and right-handed particles. The standard model predicts that we only have left-handed neutrinos, but if you, um, again, believe that anything not forbidden by symmetry should occur, then we should also be able to see right-handed neutrinos. And the explanation for why we haven't seen those could be that the mass of them is just very, very heavy and we haven't reached energies that are capable of producing them. So I can write down a generalized mass matrix um, between left and right-handed neutrinos and antineutrinos, and this is what I get. I diagonalize that to try to find the eigenstates. Uh, sorry. Um, first, I can set the left-handed Majorana, explicit left-handed Majorana mass to zero um, because, again, these left-handed neutrinos are so much lighter than the right-handed ones that we've seen, uh, many orders of magnitude. So this just simplifies diagonalizing this matrix. And when I do so, I find that there are two eigenstates for the neutrinos. Um, there is a light Majorana neutrino whose mass is inversely suppressed by the mass of this heavy right-handed neutrino that we haven't seen yet. And then I also find a heavy one whose mass is directly proportional to this right-handed mass. And so if you believe that we have these heavy right-handed neutrinos at some very large energy scale, then that gives a natural suppression for the mass of the neutrino that we measure, the very, very light one. Okay, um, so this is just kind of a status plot. Um, this is a few years old at this point, but it's still re uh, fairly relevant. So here we're looking at the experimental bounds for essentially the inverse of the lifetime for this neutrino with double beta decay process versus the mass of the lightest neutrino. So we know from neutrino oscillation experiments that we have uh, mass splittings between the various different generations of neutrinos. We don't, however, know what the very lightest one of those is. So this is an unknown. And here we're mapping out the potential discovery region for where you could find neutrinos double beta decay. Um, 
for two different scenarios. So there's IH and there's NH. So that stands for inverted hierarchy and normal hierarchy. And those are illustrated down here. So like I said, we know what the mass splittings are from oscillation experiments, but we don't know whether the splitting that we find that's larger of the two um, occurs between the two lightest neutrinos or the two heaviest neutrinos. So there's a big mass splitting and a small one that we've measured. If the small mass splitting is between the two lightest neutrinos, that's what's called the normal hierarchy. And if it's between the two heavier neutrinos, that's called the inverted hierarchy. And so you can see that there are different uh, regions of phase space which are allowed given these two hierarchies. And then these bands here are different experimental bounds. So different isotopes are used by different experiments. Um, currently xenon is giving the lowest bound um, for this inverse of the lifetime. So what goes into this picture? How do we generate these uh, bounds that we might expect to see from experiment? Well, we have to use theory for it because we haven't measured it yet, clearly. So what theory has gone into this picture? Um, essentially, it's just this diagram that I showed you at the beginning, where you have two down quarks turning into two up quarks by exchanging a light mire on a neutrino. Now, there's more to the picture than just this light neutrino exchange, and I'll talk in a moment about what um, some different mechanisms are. So if we add those, we might greatly change um, this picture that we have. And furthermore, this picture of the quarks changing from down to up has to then be propagated up to some decay of some heavy nucleus. And there's a lot of theory that you have to use to connect one to the other. And I'll talk about that also later. Um, and a lot of these uncertainties are poorly un understood. So the goal of theory is to add as much physics as we can into this picture and try to reduce the theoretical uncertainties. Okay, so how do we do that? How do we relate this short range picture? So here I am zooming in so close that I can see the individual quarks and the W's and all of these particles to kind of the long range where I see there's this big nucleus that I'm trying to look at. How do I relate the decay of one to the decay of the other? And furthermore, what physics can we put, um, can we add to the picture that we saw before? So another type of mechanism besides this light neutrino exchange, I mentioned in the seesaw model, there are also heavy right-handed neutrinos. So I could, instead of exchanging a left-handed neutrino, exchange a heavy right-handed neutrino that hasn't been included into the theory calculations. There are also mechanisms that have nothing to do with neutrinos that can still produce this decay where you have two electrons coming out and no neutrinos. So for example, some supersymmetric theories include exchanges of particles, of um, superpartner particles that can produce this decay. And we want to relate all of these because we're not necessarily going to know which of those decays is occurring when we just see two electrons coming out of a germanium nucleus to uh, what we see in experiment, right? And I have drawn the arrows both ways. So not only do I want to translate all of these different mechanisms into possible decay rates for germanium, I would also like to use experimental bounds that we have on the lifetime of this decay. So even if we never see neutrino double beta decay, we do have information that comes from the bounds on the decay and use them to constrain the parameters of this, these BSM theories. So for example, if we can take this arrow going back this direction, then we can use experimental bounds to help constrain um, so-called R parity violating coefficients. And this is important um, for potential dark matter searches. So how do we do this? Well, we know that germanium is made up of lots of neutrons and protons. We know in turn that neutrons and protons are made up of quarks and gluons. And the theory that connects all of these things is QCD. So QCD is the part of the standard model that governs the strong interaction between the quarks, which are shown here, up, down, charm, strange, top, bottom, and the gluon, which is the force carrying particle. 
So an analogy to QED, quantum electrodynamics, where you have things like electrons and the force carrying particle is the photon that translates the force between them. We have quarks that are mediated by the force carrying gluon and QCD. So this is the theory. We know that this is the theory of the strong interactions. There are some issues, however, with doing calculations directly from QCD. So as I just said, um, we have an analogy between QCD and QED, where in QCD, we have quarks that interact via exchange of gluons, just like in QED, we have electrons interacting via exchange of photons. And so you can write down the strength of this force or the probability for these guys to interact with each other um, as being proportional to some alpha. And alpha is just like the fine structure constant in uh, QED. So it's something like the charge squared. Um, and unfortunately, we know from quantum field theory that these coupling constants are actually not constant at all. Um, their value depends on what energy you probe them at. So if you try to scatter particles at very high energy, they see a different interaction than if you scatter them at very low energies. And so this plot here shows the alpha strong, the fine structure constant for the, the strong force, as a function of the scattering energy. And so if you look at high energy, that's at short distances here, this is where particle physics lives. So these accelerator experiments, they are accelerating at very high energies. And so they are in a regime where this alpha is very small. At low energies where nuclear physics governs um, QCD, we're in the regime where the coupling is very, very large. And the problem with that is that our best tool for solving things in a quantum field theory is to use perturbation theory where we assume that the coupling is small and we expand around the non-interacting limit. So at long distances or low energies where nuclear physics comes in, we can't do that. We don't have some small parameter that we can do perturbation theory around. It's also the reason why at, um, at low energies, all of the quarks and gluons are confined inside hadrons. So you never see a free quark or a free gluon at low energies. They're always, always, they're always bound up into um, these things that we call hadrons, which are roughly grouped into things uh, called nucleons, which include the neutron and the proton. Um, we also have mesons, which are combinations of quarks and antiquarks, um, like the pion. So the physics is very, very different for these two different scales. And this is the regime that I'm interested in here, the low energy regime. Okay, so if I can't use perturbation theory, then how do I calculate anything? So the tool that I use is lattice QCD. Um, essentially, you can think of lattice QCD as being a numerical solution to QCD at low energies. So we take the theory, we manipulate it in such a way that the problem becomes small enough that I can just throw it on a computer, hit enter, and a result comes out. It's not like that at all, but um, in theory, you can think of it in your head as just, I put the theory in and out comes my result. What's important about this is that it's not a model. Um, we are directly solving QCD, and so all of the uncertainties that come from that are quantifiable and maybe systematically removed, as opposed to a model where you never know if I add another term to my model, how it's going to change things. The problem is that QCD doesn't fit on a computer. You can't just type it in, hit enter, and get a, a number. So there are several things we have to do in order to make our problem finite. So what we do is we take the thing we want to study, the universe, and the first thing we do is we take space and time, which we normally think of as being continuous variables. I can always take space and break it down into smaller and smaller chunks. And we say, no, there's some finite resolution at which I can see space and time. And so that's kind of like taking the universe and pixelating it. The next thing we do is we take the infinite expanse of the universe and we truncate it. We only look at a finite region of that space. 
And now I've taken my infinite dimensional path integral into a finite dimensional integral that I can in principle put onto a computer. So the dimension of the integral here has become the number of squares that are in my box. The problem is it's still not small enough to fit on a computer um, or to fit on any computer that would ever fit inside our universe. So we have to do one more step, which is that we don't put the whole thing on the computer. We do what's called Monte Carlo sampling of this path integral, um, which you can think of as sampling the quantum vacuum. You have all of these gluons and quark and quark pairs that are popping in and out of existence on small scales according to the uncertainty principle. We sample the possible configurations of those. And then we stick in whatever probes we're interested in learning about. So if I want to learn about a neutron, I might stick in an up quark and two down quarks and I can measure correlations. And from that, I can get information. And then in the end, we have to undo everything that we did. We take the infinite volume limit, we take the continuum limit, and we do this by just taking successively larger volumes and extrapolating and successively smaller lattice spacings. Um, and for technical reasons, we also typically have to do an extrapolation in the quark masses or the pion masses in order to get to the physical point. Okay, and after, let's see, Lattice QCD was largely developed starting in the 80s, so it's taken 40 years to get to this point, but we are finally in an era where we have big enough computers, good enough algorithms, and a good enough understanding of the theory behind it that we're actually starting to come up with um, results that are comparable to, and in some cases, better than experimental precision. So this is just to highlight an example from a few years ago um, of a measurement of the neutron proton mass difference, which was accurate to 300 keV. Okay, so lattice QCD is a well-established theory at this point. Um, a lot of work has gone into trying to make the calculations efficient on the computers that we have. But even still, um, and I don't think I'm being pessimistic in saying this, lattice QCD will never directly calculate your favorite heavy nucleus. So you're not going to be able to put germanium onto a lattice. There are a number of reasons for that. Um, you would need an extremely large number of lattice points in order to resolve both the large scale, the size of the nucleus, and also the small scale where you're starting with your quarks and gluons. The number of diagrams you have to calculate blows up uh, very quickly, factorially. Um, if you want to calculate the nucleon, it's two diagrams. The deuteron, you're already at 36. And by the time you get to helium-4, you're at 500,000. Um, and this just becomes intractable. And then probably the biggest problem is with this Monte Carlo sampling. So the Monte Carlo calculations have a, an inherent stochastic noise associated with them. And this noise we find grows exponentially with all the different limits you want to take. So uh, in particular, it grows exponentially with the number of nucleons that you have in your system. And unfortunately, you can't just beat down exponential problems with bigger computers. And really, it comes down to an issue of degrees of freedom. So we want to study all of these different scales, but the different energy scales have different relevant degrees of freedom. So at the very short distances, quarks and gluons are relevant, but at the very large distances, you have um, very low energy excitations like the rotational states in uranium. And if you use the same degrees of freedom to try to describe them all, um, as often quoted by Weinberg, you can use any degrees of freedom you like. So in principle, you can start with quarks and gluons and calculate this rotational state in uranium. In uranium but if you use the wrong ones, you'll be sorry. So quarks and gluons are just not a good choice for understanding these very low energy excitations. So lattice QC doesn't work on its own. Um, this is a slide taken from John Engel um, for a DOE topical collaboration that we have looking at double beta decay. And you can see that we use many different techniques looking at these different energy scales that use different degrees of freedom. And we use multiple techniques for a given energy scale even, and they all feed into each other. So lattice QCD starts up here at the top. Um, you can think of lattice QCD as being kind of equivalent to data because it's just 
coming from the theory directly. And those feed into different methods that use the correct degrees of freedom for a given energy scale. Okay, so how do we do this um, translation from short range, uh, high energy scale to long range, low energy scale? So I'm just gonna discuss the first kind of matching that we want to do with lattice QCD onto the next theory that can take us to higher A nuclei. So looking at this picture for neutrino level beta decay, um, and so right now we're looking at the very, very short uh, range picture. I have split this up into what are called long range mechanisms and short range mechanisms. So by long range mechanisms, I mean this light neutrino exchange diagram that is typically used for these calculations. The reason I say it's long range is because the neutrino is very light. So according to the uncertainty principle, the neutrino can propagate for long times and therefore long distances. And so it can potentially propagate across the entire length of the nucleus before being absorbed again. So the long range is referring to just what's going on in the middle here. And then we'll also look at short range mechanisms where the particles that are running through uh, this propagator here are heavy and therefore don't propagate for long distances. And so we're gonna look at this picture. We're going to look at the different energy scales and see what this picture will look like when we go to hadronic scales. So for the long range mechanism, as I said, this neutrino is light. Um, the W bosons are relatively heavy. So if we zoom out um, to a longer scale or a lower energy scale, essentially those heavy particles don't appear to propagate at all. Um, we can't resolve the short distance where they're propagating. And so it appears that this occurs at some point like interaction. I can now zoom out again to hadronic scales where nucleons are the degrees of freedom rather than quarks. And so I find that these quarks become dressed, um, the down quarks become dressed as neutrons, and then those are converted into protons. So this is the typical picture that we think of when we think of um, double beta decay in terms of nucleons. We have two neutrons simultaneously decaying into two protons and emitting two electrons. And I can do the same thing for the other side, the short range mechanism. Oh, sorry, uh, one more thing. So these, uh, these interactions here are known. So it is known that the rate at which neutrons decay into protons um, depends on this quantity called GA, which is the axial charge of the neutron. And this is a known quantity from experiment. All right, so now moving on to the short range part. Now we have heavy particles running through everything in the middle here. So if I zoom out to, um, to lower energy scales, then the entire propagation in the center appears to occur at a single point. And I get some effective contact interaction here where two down quarks come in at to a point and out come two up quarks. And all the details of what was going on inside there are encoded into parameters that depend on their, the various parameters of the VSM theory. And if I now wanna to go to hadronic scales, so I want to talk about this in terms of neutrons and protons, the simple way is to do just what we did before. We can dress them um, and show that we have two neutrons going to two protons, but now they interact via a single point. So this is a short range contact interaction. There's a second way that I can do this. So this is the same diagram I had just a moment before. I can reverse the direction of two of these particle propagations and turn them into antiquarks. I haven't done anything here. This is the same diagram. But now when I zoom out to hadronic scales, it looks like I have quark antiquark pairs, which hopefully you remember, um, combine to form mesons. So this picture looks like a pi minus undergoing double beta decay and turning into a pi plus. And this can be embedded into a two neutron goes to two proton diagram in the following way. A neutron emits a pion and turns into a proton. That pion undergoes double beta decay and is absorbed to produce the second neutron decay. 
the pion is a relatively light particle, and so um, its propagation does not shrink to a point when we're at hadronic scales here, so it's still included in the diagram. This uh, contact interaction for the neutron turning into a proton is again related to GA, so that's known. But this pi minus to pi plus transition is completely unknown. It's not something that we can measure um, from experiment. And since we haven't seen neutrinos double beta decay, we don't have any bounds on what this might be. So these are three different uh, diagrams that you can consider calculating. Um, so two of them are essentially complete. Uh, these are calculations done by my group um, in the last several years. So uh, we've calculated the axial charge to less than a percent level. And we also did a full calculation of the pi minus to pi plus transition. Um, and those are included in these two papers. So I don't wanna focus on those. I want to focus on the future and where we're going with this. And so that is in the third diagram that I wrote down here. This two neutrons goes to two protons via some contact. So this falls into a more general category of two nucleon calculations in lattice QCD, which is still a relatively young field. So just thinking about two, uh, two nucleons in general, what might we want to learn from theory so one is these NN matrix elements, these two nucleon matrix elements, which are unknown, um, which are relevant for neutrinos double beta decay, as I already described. Um, there are other two nucleon matrix elements of interest. So for example, there um, are uh, searches for hadronic parity violation. Well, searches, they've, they've actually measured it um, at Oak Ridge with the NPD gamma experiment, sorry. Um, and so on the lattice, we would also like to calculate these parity violating two nucleon matrix elements. So there are a whole host of them that are relevant for these experimental searches. But even more fundamentally, um, what can theory do that experiment can't? Well, one thing is that we can change parameters of the theory and see what happens. Experimentalists are not allowed to change the charge of the electron, for example. But theorists can, because they can do what we want. So an example of this, um, which I like to tell to my students, um, so what is a parameter in my theory that I can vary? So you can think about the mass of the quarks. So in nature, in the standard model, we know that the Higgs boson gives mass to the quarks. And you can, um, you can measure these, it's a little convoluted because you don't have asymptotic free quarks, but you can say that roughly the mass of the up quark is two MeV, the mass of the down quark is five MeV. And so you might say, okay, so can I use this to calculate the mass of the proton, which has two up quarks and a down quark? And what you find from experiment is that the mass of the proton is 938 MeV, which is nowhere near what you would get by just adding up the masses that come from the masses of the quarks, which are given to them by the Higgs boson. You can even go further. I'm a theorist, so I can say, I'm gonna turn my Higgs field off. I'm going to say that my quarks have no mass at all. And even in that limit where you have completely massless particles, the mass of the proton is still 900 MeV. So what's going on here? Clearly, the Higgs is not giving the mass of the proton, or it's giving very little of the mass of the proton, because I turned it off and I still have a heavy proton. So what's actually happening is that the proton is not made of two ups and one down quark. Um, it's actually because we have this non-perturbative system there's a whole sea of gluons and more quarks that are binding them together or into the proton. And since we know that E equals mc squared, this binding energy we see as the mass that um, our proton has. So 95% of the mass of the proton comes from binding energy of QCD and not the Higgs. So this is my picture you see the usual cartoon of how the Higgs boson gives mass to particles. You have um, some scientists moving through a sea of other scientists and gaining inertia. Um, in my world, it's really 
QCD that gives you the mass of this whale, which is traveling through this Higgs field, which are these little fishies. And every now and again, it eats one and it gains a little bit of inertia. But in reality, almost all of the mass is coming from the QCD part of it. And I want to go even further um, and say that in nature, the Higgs boson gives mass to the quarks. In my world, the theorist gives mass to the quarks. The mass is a parameter in my theory. I can turn it to be whatever I want it to be. I can turn down the Higgs field, I can turn up the Higgs field, and I can see what happens to, for example, the mass of the proton. And so one interesting question you might ask is, if I dial these masses, um, what happens to things like uh, solar fusion? So if I change the mass of the quark too much, can I no longer have the fusion chain that produces carbon and therefore produces life? Would we still exist? So what about nuclei? Um, this is what we're talking about. Going back to the two nucleon calculations that I'm interested in. So the smallest nucleus is a deuteron. Uh, it's a bound state of a proton and a neutron. And so one question I can ask with my theory is, what happens when I change the masses of the quarks? Um, what happens to the binding energy of the deuteron? So the deuteron is a very special nucleus. Um, it's finely tuned in nature. And what I mean by that is that if you look at the binding energy per nucleon versus the mass number A, most of your nuclei are up here at about eight MeV per nucleon. The deuteron is down here. It is very finely tuned, it's very loosely bound, a very, very small binding energy compared to all the others. And so this fine tuning, you might think, is very sensitive to things like the masses of the quarks. And so that's something we can explore with the theory. And the deuteron, um, the fact that the deuteron is finely tuned is important for things like Big Bang nucleosynthesis and also for solar fusion. Okay, so back to our two nucleon calculations. Um, how do experimentalists measure two nucleon interactions? Well, you can take two nucleons, scatter them off each other at different energies and see what is the scattering phase shift. We can't do that on the lattice though. So on the lattice, we have a finite volume. And so you can't prepare these asymptotic states, which are plane waves that you say are separated in time and scatter them off each other. In a finite volume, what we have are a series of discrete energy levels inside our box. Um, so just if you think of a quantum mechanics problem, if I put my system into a finite volume, then my energy levels are quantized. So it looks very different than what they have in experiment. So there are a number of different theoretical ways that you can translate a lattice observable, um, which is, for example, a series of energy levels in a box to an interaction or a scattering phase shift. Um, the ones that I'm going to focus on. So the most widely used is called the Lucher method, and I'll very quickly go through what that is, um, because it's also what is used by my group. There's a Japanese group who came up with a new method called the potential method. Um, essentially, they calculate a two-nucleon potential from lattice uh, data. And then there's also an effective field theory uh, type approach where they're basically using lattice data to tune parameters in their theory. So Lucher, um, very quickly, we're going to do a baby version of Lucher. So we're going to be looking in one dimension. So this is the dimension that my two particles can travel in. They are scattering off each other with some momentum P. So if I wanted to solve this quantum mechanics problem, what would I do? I would say I have a wave function. It looks like a plane wave plus some phase shift that is due to the interaction between them. I can now put it in a finite volume, so in one dimension with periodic boundary conditions that looks like a circle, and I impose my boundary condition, and this is what gives me my discrete set of energy levels. From this, I get a quantization condition, so only certain values, P, N, P star, are allowed within this box, and you can plot the P star Ns versus the volume or the size of your circle, and you get a set of energy levels. So what we do on the lattice is we measure these energy levels. We can either fix the volume and look at multiple um, excitations, 
or we can change our volume and calculate energies at different L. And from that, we get a set of P stars that are allowed. We can plug that into this quantization condition and solve for what the scattering phase shift is at that energy eigenvalue. And then we can use something like an effective range expansion or some interpolation to try to get information about the points in between. And this has been done very successfully, um, particularly in looking at meson scattering. So this is two pions um, scattering from lattice data from uh, the group at JLab. And they looked at different quark masses and saw what happens to the rho resonance. And so as you raise the quark mass, eventually the rho becomes bound and it's no longer a resonance. And this was seen through the lattice data. So we want to do this for nucleons. Um, so one of the first questions that people looked at is what happens to the deuteron if I crank up my quark mass? And we want to look at what the different different methods give. So the Lucher method. Um, these two groups, uh, they used the Lucher method for this heavy quark mass and found that the deuteron was very deeply bound, much more deeply bound than it is in nature. Also using the Lucher method, uh, my group, CalAT, found two bound states, one which was deeply bound, which coincided with the uh, ones found by these groups, and one which was loosely bound, roughly what it is in nature. This EFT method that I mentioned only found a loosely bound state. And then finally, the potential method found no bound states at all. So this is a disaster. Um, we have different methods that in principle should give us the same results and they don't even qualitatively agree on the number of bound states in the system at very heavy quark mass. So this is a very important controversy that needs to be resolved before we can do anything more in two nucleon calculations on the lattice. Um, so the potential and EFT methods I didn't talk about, there are a, a series of systematics that are known um, that haven't been fully explored yet. So it could be that those systematics are leading to incorrect conclusions. Lucher, though, I mean, it was really just a, a solution to a quantum mechanics problem, and I didn't put any assumptions or approximations into it. The only assumption that I put into it was that the energy levels that I was putting into the quantization condition were the correct ones. And so as a, a user of the Lucher method, my job is to figure out what might be going wrong with what I'm doing. And so we've looked very heavily into spectroscopy. How well can we determine these energies from the lattice? Um, okay, I'm looking at how much time I have left to see how much detail I want to go into. So um, just a very broad overview, how do you calculate an energy on a lattice? Um, you put down some operator which has the right quantum numbers for the state you're interested in. So if it's a proton, I could put down, or sorry, this is a neutron, I can put down an up and two down quarks. And what I do is I create it at one time and then I annihilate it at another time. So I have a creation operator at time zero, annihilation at time t. We can uh, translate this operator at time t into the operator at time zero times some time evolution operator. Um, note we are in Euclidean time. So instead of an i h t, I have an e to the minus h t. There's a reason we do that. And it's basically because it has this exponential form instead of the oscillating form that we normally have. You can insert a complete set of quantum states. And what you find are that you have a sum of constants, which are basically telling you how good of an operator you chose compared to the full non-perturbative interacting eigenstate times an exponential that falls off with the energy of that state. This looks a lot like a Boltzmann factor. Um, this looks like a partition function, except that it has these funny coefficients out front here, but we can interpret it like a partition function. And we can think about taking the long time limit. So as we go to long time, that's like going to zero temperature. And as you go to larger and larger times, all of the heavier states are gonna die off and eventually you're left with just the ground state. So you can think of the long time limit as like the zero temperature limit. And this is how we extract these energies. 
So um, these are the kinds of data plots we look at. This is an effective mass plot. It's just the log of the ratio of correlators that you can show at late times will plateau to a ground state energy and at early times is contaminated with excited states. So the problem with nucleons, I already mentioned this, is exponential signal to noise problem. You wanna to go to the large Euclidean time limit to just separate off a single state, except that the noise grows exponentially with Euclidean time. So you can't go out arbitrarily long. So what you really want to do is to instead minimize contamination from excited states so that you can pick off the ground state earlier in time where the points are very precise. And so that is what my group has been working very hard on is coming up with very good operators that have a lot of overlap with the ground state, but not a lot of overlap with these excited states. Okay, um, so I don't have time to go into too much detail about this. Um, one of the ways that you do this is instead of having a single operator, you can come up with multiple operators that still have the same quantum numbers. And you can try to take linear combinations of those operators that gets rid of the first excited state. So you try to cancel this excited state. And then that already pulls your ground state back to much earlier times where the data is more precise. And then kind of the state of the art approach, which was used for this lovely data that I showed you in the beginning for pi pi scattering is to take that to the extreme. So instead of having two operators, I have a very large basis of operators. This gives me a matrix of correlators that I can diagonalize and I can get a whole series of eigenstates of the system that way. And this is just now starting to be applied to systems with baryons and nucleons because of the signal to noise problem. It's just computationally very expensive, but we're just now getting to the point where we can do that. And with my group, um, I've developed a method for doing these so-called generalized eigenvalue problems with a large basis of operators. Um, where we kind of sample the different operators stochastically. So we don't calculate everything exactly because it's too expensive to do computationally. And so that is what the S stands for in this S laugh technique. Um, laugh, this lap is Laplacian heavy side. That's the operator that we're trying to um, diagonalize. And so this is brand new data um, just out from last week, looking at the deuteron at heavy quark mass using this new the state of the art kind of uh, formalism. And so here we're plotting Q cotangent delta versus Q squared. So this is a scattering phase shift versus the energy. And we can compare that to old data. So this is some of the NPL QCD data that found a very deeply bound state. Um, a bound state in the system comes from looking for a pole in the scattering amplitude. And on this plot where you would see that pole would be where your phase shift crosses with IQ, which is what this blue line is here. And so the deeply bound uh, results that were found before found lots of states that overlapped with um, this IQ. And therefore, this is where this pole for the heavy deuteron came from. But if you look at our data, there's no uh, evidence that we are ever going to see a crossing between these two curves here. And therefore, we show no evidence for a bound state using this new technique for operators, but still using the Lucher method. So this is the updated plot. Um, I don't know, we probably caused more controversy than less. Um, so now we have a Lucher method, which has no bound state in the system, but there's still work to do. Um, we still need to add more operators to our basis. And we're also currently doing a comparison of all of these methods using the same lattice parameters so that we can compare apples to apples. Um, and we'll have a study coming out that hopefully highlights what the different systematics are in there and resolves this controversy. Coming soon. All right, so to wrap this up, um, I'm essentially out of time here, but I wanted to highlight the low energy beyond the standard level searches, which use um, nuclei as a laboratory. And Lattice QCD is my method that I use to connect the standard model to nuclear physics. Um, it's been very successful so far in looking at neutrino double beta decay observables. But in the future, we need to start looking at multi-nucleon calculations. 
the theoretical situation from the lattice is very murky, but we are putting in a lot of work to try to resolve this so that we can more, uh, we can go forward in a more trustworthy manner. So that is all. Um, thank you for listening. Thanks very much for a very nice talk. Um, and uh, I imagine that there are some questions. So uh, usually we like to give students the opportunity to ask the first question. So are there any students who would like to raise a hand? Don't be shy. Maybe not. If you're, you're welcome to jump in when, when, when you have anything to ask about. But let's open it up to everybody now. So, so I'll start with a very mundane question. <laughs> um, when you when you talk about the having the capacity to do these. Uh, lattice calculations what what is the state of the art how how i don't know, how, I don't know if it's best um if, it, if it's best measured in in cpu time or or <laughs> date or months or or what how, how yeah. you... um so these calculations typically take on the order of one to two years um running on Summit, which is the biggest computer that we have in this country. Um, they are about as computationally intense as you get. Um, I have collaborators at Livermore, and every time a new computer comes online before it, beco before it goes behind the fence and does classified research, they always want us to run our lattice code on it because they know we're going to break it. <laughs> because our computations are just so big um, and so intense. So yeah, these are extremely large calculations. Uh, Calvin Howell, you have a question? Uh, yeah, first of all, thank you very much for a very comprehensive and uh, uh, informative uh, presentation. I have a question um, about um, whether you're positioned or have thought about, um, uh, for instance, a photo production of, of pi zeros uh, off of proton. Uh, Weinberg some time ago said that uh, this reaction, if you can use it to determine the um, pi on nucleon scattering length, then that should be sensitive to at least a ratio of the up and down core masses. Yeah, so um, I have not, but the this group at JLab that I mentioned that looked at the row resonance, um, they have looked at some photo production calculations. Um, the the kind of theory behind it. So the the Lucher method for looking at two particle scattering can be generalized for matrix elements in a finite volume. And so um, the formalism for how you get the finite volume physics of that problem um, is a little bit tricky, but it's been worked out. Um, so yeah, definitely the, uh, the JLab group is very interested in such calculations. Um, I can't quote you what their overall findings were, but. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Shaila Chandrasekharan. Hi, Amy. Uh, excellent talk. Thank you. Um, one quick question. What fermions do you use um, in your calculations? Is it the main wall or staggered? Or? So for our, for the neutrinos double beta decay, the pi minus to pi plus transition, and also the GA calculation, um, we used a mixed action. So our C was staggered and the valence was domain wall. And that helped a lot, um, having the domain wall in the valence um, and reduced the uncertainties. I think it was 
critical in that GA calculation. For the nucleon-nucleon scattering, um, we are using clover fermions. They're just cheaper. Domain wall is too expensive for two nucleons. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Other questions? Well, I will ask one more then myself. Sure. Um, I'm I'm not exactly sure how to frame the question, but it, it it's about the interaction between the lattice QCD community and the EFT community that that might be trying to figure out analytic ways to simplify these these problems or or uh, you know, figure out which diagrams are the most important ones or, or something. Is yeah. there any hope of speeding things up through? So, <laughs> yeah, so um, unfortunately, so yes, there's a lot of interplay. Um, I want to go back to here. So I had these three diagrams that I wrote down here. Um, and these are diagrams that you can put into effective field theory. Um, and so, for example, we gave them this coefficient, they plug that into this diagram and they calculate it. The issue with EFTs for nucleons is that there's no good power counting scheme for how to rate which of these diagrams is most important. So using kind of the classic Weinberg power counting scheme, one and two, our leading order and then this contact one is suppressed it's next to next to leading order and so that's why we tackled this one first it's also the easiest to do on the lattice you don't have to worry about these two nucleon issues but what our collaboration with the eft people has revealed is that in reality this contact interaction here um, because of the fine tuning in the two neutron channel is enhanced. So it's not next to next to leading order. And that means we have to calculate it. Um, and that's been kind of the biggest thing that has come out of um, this, the, the EFT group for this. And so they found that not only is this contact enhanced relative to the pion exchange one, it's also enhanced for the light neutrino exchange. And so this usual diagram where you just say, oh, it's two power of the GA and I have a light neutrino propagator doesn't work. Um, they say we really have to calculate the full non-perturbative two neutrons goes to two protons. And the only way you can do that is with lattice QCD. So that's why we're putting a lot of effort into these two nucleon calculations. Other questions? Okay, well, as, as usual, it's always um, uh, hard to have a colloquium without actually having a chance to get together and people, people forming small groups when it's over to, to chat a little more, but uh, I hope that will happen in one form or another. And uh, let's thank uh, Professor Nicholson one more time for, for a really nice talk um, on a very interesting subject. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. All right.